God for keeping us down through the years here. We are located yeah. at 1153 Hamilton Avenue, right here in the beautiful city of Seaside, California, where our pastor is Pastor Gene Jackson. Yeah. 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 So Psalms 136, when you have it, say amen. amen. Psalms amen. 136. Uh, it is a, a song of thanksgiving, and uh, I want, we're all going to say the last part together, which is, for he is good, and his mercy endures. Yeah. So I'm going to read the first part, and we all want to read the last part together. Everybody read okay. Psalms 136. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of God, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord of Lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him that stretches out the earth above the waters, for, for his, his mercy endures forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy, mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his, his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for, for his, his mercy endures forever. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn. For his mercy endures forever. And brought out Israel from among them. For his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm. For his mercy endures forever. To him which divided the Red Sea in the parts. For his mercy endures forever. And made Israel to pass through the midst of the for his mercy endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. For his mercy endures forever. To him which led his people through the wilderness. For his mercy endures forever. To him which smote great kings. For his mercy endures forever. And slew famous kings. For his mercy endures forever. Zion, king of the Amorites. For his mercy endures forever. Or the king of Hashem. For his mercy endures forever. And gave the land for an inheritance. For his mercy endures forever. Even an inheritance unto Israel, his servant. For his mercy endures forever. Who remember us in our low estate. For his mercy endures forever. And has redeemed us from our enemies. For his mercy endures forever. Who gives food to all flesh. For his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks in the God of heaven. For his mercy endures forever. Father, we just thank you this morning. Oh, yes. Lord, we just bless your mighty name. Yes, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for this season that the world recognizes as Thanksgiving. But to us, every day is a day of thanks. Yes, yes. Because every day, Father, is the day that you have made. Yes. And we will rejoice and be glad. Yes. And we thank you, Lord, for this day yes. that you have prepared and planned for us to be in your house, in your presence, to worship you, Father. Right. And Father, as we stand in your presence, oh God, before you and your people, Father, we just thank you for your anointing that destroys every you. Your anointing that removes every burden. We thank you for the precious blood of your son, Jesus, that made all of this possible. And we just thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, Father. Right. For your demonstration of your presence in this place, Father. That all may see and all may know that you are the true and the living God. And we just thank you, Lord. And we say, here we are. This is your service. We yield ourselves to you, Father, yes. to be used by you as you please, Father. And we just thank you, and we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Brother Roger, could you put up a decoration, please? 
and we are going to not simply just read something, even though it's on the screen for us to see and to read, but we are declaring this from our hearts. Everybody ready? Ready. So we, we have come, come here today, today to worship the Lord and to hear what he has to say. He has led us to this place that is full of his spirit and love, and it reminds us that all good things come from above. By God's spirit and not by might, the people shall press their way to this Holy Ghost site. It is not hard for us to see that a dying world is out there, and at God's request, until they are saved, I shall not rest. As a child of the Father, I pledge to do my part. I will actively seek to lead the lost to God. Truly, there is a reality in serving the Holy One. Just look and see what the Lord has done. We call them from the four corners of our community to come and partake of this glorious opportunity. But for this hour, my heart is turned to the Holy One to praise, worship, and give thanks for all that He has done. This is my Holy Bible, the inherent and infallible Word of God, and I rely on my Bible with all my heart. I was glad when He said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen.
know through his mercy endures forever. And I'm grateful for that this morning. Good morning, church, those in the house and those online. We bless the Lord for your presence here today. And we thank the Lord for another Sunday, another opportunity to give him the praise. There's no one else that is worthy of the praise like our God. Yes. And we owe it all to him. Amen. You see that word owe? It means a debt that you need to pay. I need to pay. We owe it all to him. Why do we owe him? Because he has done so much for us. Yes. And so we owe him our praise. Yes. That's the least that we can That's do. That's right. So we give God praise this morning. Yes. Again, thank you for being here today. We're going to look to the Lord this morning, and we're going to turn to the book of Jude. That's the last book before Revelations. It's only one chapter. Yes. And so we're going to look at Jude this morning. Yes, amen. We're going to be reading from the 20th through the 25th verse. It only has 25 verses in the entire chapter. Jude, verse 20 through 25. Amen. It's good to wait and hear the pages turning. Yes. That means you're going to the Word, you're Amen. looking for the Word. That's a good thing. Yes, the more you learn to get to the Word, the quicker you'll be able to get to the Word. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Amen. Reading from the King James Version, it reads, For you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. amen. That word amen means so be it. Amen. And so, Father, we thank you for your word thank today. You, we thank you for your people today. We ask, God, that you would use my lips, Father, to speak forth your truth. Yes, God. Lord God, that you would give us clarity, understanding, Father. Lord God, that we would hide this word in our hearts, that we might live thereby. That the enemy would steal nothing. We pray that you would steal it. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God say, Amen. 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 Take your seats. Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Yes. As I mentioned, that this is the last book before you get to Revelations. And this uh, book is talking about, the theme of this book is contending for the faith. Contending for the faith. In Luke 18, 8, the B part of that well, eighth verse, it reads, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith in the earth? I'm going to read that again. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith in the earth? That's why this book is talking about contending for the faith. Because so many people are departing from the faith in these last days. And so Jude here introduces himself as a bond servant uh, of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. And it is thought by many that he is also the half-brother of Jesus. And so this book is talking about the divine sovereignty of God, and it's talking about human responsibility. <coughs> we are humans, so that means we have a responsibility for some things. And so it's about whose teaching, those whose teaching and speech causes the listeners to run to what they are saying rather than to adhere to what the word of the Lord says. It's about assurance and comfort of those who fear the Lord and who follow after his word. So today's message is entitled, The Sevenfold Duty of the True Believer. Don't forget the true believer. You see, the true believers are differentiated from those who are merely professing. You can profess. I profess that I know King Tutu. 
uh, I don't have to really no key to, to just something I said. And so this book is to the true believer, which is differentiated between those who just profess or just say something, but there is no change in their hearts. And so in this, the brief 25 verses of this book that we are talking about today, it's talking about, the, it's a word called apostasy. That word apostasy means the falling away. The falling away. And it's talking about the falling away of those who have professed to know Jesus, have been in the church perhaps for years, and have even worked in the church for years, but they were going through the motions. They were following after what they saw others doing, but there had never been a true change in their hearts. And so Jude here is warning those in his day, and I'm warning those of us in our day, that we have to be careful that we're not just saying words, but there's no conviction in our heart, there's no change in our heart, that we are truly, truly believing what our lips are speaking. I used to say, make sure your lip and your life line up. See, because you can speak one thing with your lip, but your life can say something totally different. So let your lip and your life line up. And this is what Jude is talking about here this morning. <clears throat> Even during 2 uh, Timothy and 2 Peter, this apostasy or this falling away was already set in in the church. Now that has been over 2,000 years ago that this was happening. And if it was happening way back over 2,000 years ago, guess what's taking place today in this time in which we live? There's more and more and more because sin has progressed and progressed and progressed and continues to progress. And so there is the falling away from the professed believers. See, they're called believers, but they're just professing to believe. They're not true believers. And we want to make sure that we are in the right place, that our confession, our profession, is truly what we believe in. It's truly the, the way our heart has been taught and turned. And so, as we see all over the world today, we see churches that are facing this falling away because many have turned aside to other things. So we need to be aware, church, of what stands between us and the truth. We need to be aware of those things because people can speak to us and they can sound so good. And I, I think that's the best word. It sounds good. It doesn't necessarily have to be the truth. All it needs to be is just to sound good. And so there are those that are sounding good and they come saying that they're preaching the gospel, but they're not preaching the true gospel, that, that, that which is between the, the pages of this book. They're preaching what is called another gospel. It's a feel-good gospel that they're preaching. And so we don't want to get caught up with that. We want to make sure, and that's why we need to be in our word for ourselves. You can't just trust and depend on those who are standing before you to give you the word only. Not that they're telling you a lie, but you need to know the word for yourself so that you can say amen when they say what the word of the Lord says. And you can say, if they're not saying what the word says, there was an old, old saint many years ago in the church that I used to go to, she said, ain't in the book. <laughs> right in the middle of service, she said, ain't in the book. And so we need to know what's in the book and what's not in the book. Amen. And so we want to follow after those things which are in the book. You see, it's easy to wander, to, to go away from uh, the things that are, are, tr are truthful. It's easy because if something sounds better than what we've been reading, you know, we, we like, we are feel good people. We want you to make us feel good. And so we want to, you to tell us something that sounds good. And so you can tend to wander away from the things of God. What should be called sin, you call it an individual. It's just my individual choice. And we're seeing a lot of that today. Amen. Where people are following after their individual choice. You know, your truth, my truth. But there's really only one truth, Amen. and it's here. Amen. This is the truth. Right. 
You can have your truth and I can have my truth, but this is the Amen. truth. And there's no truth that can uh, prevent this, that can overcome this, because this is the word of God. It doesn't change. I don't care how many years pass. I don't care how, how many people come and try to say something different. It's going to be the same truth that it has always been. Amen. And so that's the truth that we want to build our foundation on because it doesn't change. Everything else changed. I may have your truth today, but somebody else come along tomorrow with their truth, and their truth sounds better than your truth, and so I'm following after their truth. But if we follow after the truth, Yes. We don't have to be flipping and flopping and changing all the time. We just need to be steadfast in what the word of the Lord says. Amen. Now, we find people having what is called itching ears. That's a figure of speech, and it refers to people who have um, desires that drive them uh, to believe whatever it is that they want to believe because they have itching ears. If it sounds good to them, oh yes, well, I can leave this over here because this sounds better. But do you know, just because it sounds better doesn't mean that it is better. You need to make sure you know what the word of the Lord says. These people decide for themselves what is right and what is wrong. And they seek others to support them. They try to persuade you to believe like they believe. Itching ears are concerned with what feels good and what uh, sounds good. It's not about what the truth is, because truth is often uncomfortable. Do you know that? Yeah. Truth is often uncomfortable, but it's still the truth. The Greek word that's translated itching literally means to itch or to rub or to scratch. And it's about sermons that tickle your ear or massage you rather than give you the message. It's about sermons that charm, uh, charm you rather than challenge you. It's about uh, entertainment. It doesn't edify you. It just makes you feel good. It doesn't build you up. It's about messages that please rather than preach because when you preach the gospel, you're going to get the truth. You're going to get the part you like, and you're going to get the part that you don't like, but it's still the gospel. And so Paul, and one other commentator says, it's as people with ears which have to continually be titillated or tickled. They need to hear something new, something unique, something different. You know, well, we've heard that before. We want to hear something different. But the truth doesn't change. So if the truth doesn't change, what are you looking for something different for? If it's different, then it's not the truth. That ought to be our first key right there. It's not the truth because it's not what we know. It's not what God says. And so we want to, we want to make sure that we are walking in the way that God would have us to walk. We're hearing the right things because uh, Peter, or uh, Paul, and this other commentator says people just want their ears tickled. They want to be titillated. And the evidence of this is, is that people like messages where they're not required to change. Give me a message where I don't have to do anything. I can just keep on doing what I'm doing. Don't give me a message that is going to require something of me, like repentance. That's outmoded. You don't hear people talking about, you need to repent. You need to repent. <clears throat> Don't hear those kind of messages anymore, but that's still the word of God. When you find yourself in sin, and I say you find yourself, or you come to yourself, or somebody tell you that you're walking in sin, you need to repent. Repent means to turn around, to stop going in the same direction. It means to go in the opposite direction, because it's a 180 turn. See, 180 turn is here. If I give you a 360 turn, I'm all the way back over here. So we only need to turn and go 180. Turn from the things that you're doing so that God can be blessed and, and bless, so that God can bless you, save your life, my time, my tongue. So that God can bless you and you can receive all that he has for you. We are called to salvation and we are also called to service. We're called to salvation. That's the first call. After we've been saved, we are called to serve, to serve God and to serve others. 
So we have a duty to live for Jesus as his people. When we live the truth of the gospel, then we are sure to defend and contend for the gospel. We need to fight for what the gospel says. Don't just take it as the river just flowing on by. You know, it's just a river flowing by. And so we don't have to do anything except look at it, drink from it, swim in it, or whatever, but we don't ever have to do anything to change it. So we need to be contending for the faith. Why do we need to contend for the faith? Because we have an enemy, and he has many helpers. And it is always trying to pull us off the, the center, the straight and narrow way. It's always trying to get us to try something different because it sounds good, because it feels good. And so we need to contend to remain in the faith that was given to us through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So that contend means we got to wrestle with that thing. We got to persevere with it. We got to keep on pressing in on it. Because it's when we live the truth that of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, not the truth that somebody else gave you, that we can defend it and contend for it most effectively. We don't keep the course of steadfast faith accidentally. It doesn't just happen. You got to work toward it. I know some of you may think that once you accepted Jesus Christ and came in, into the, the family of God, that you didn't have to do anything else, just try not to do anything wrong, and everything was good. But you see, we have an enemy. We have a force that's pressing against us to keep us from where we are, keep us from going further, but to take us back from where we came. And so we need to contend for the faith. It's a costly path, church. It requires diligence, it requires repentance, it requires the Holy Spirit's sanctifying work. The church's remedy for this is having, for those who have itching ears, is 2 Timothy 4 and 2. And it says, preach the word. In season, that means when they want to hear it, and out of season, even if they don't want to hear it, you keep on preaching the word. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and give careful instruction. So part of my responsibility as the pastor is to preach the word, whether you want to hear it or whether you don't want to hear it, whether you like it or whether you dislike it. I have a charge, and I will be held responsible if I fail to, to discharge this word the way it is written in the Bible. God will hold me responsible because as your pastor, I watch over your souls. I'm the one that holds you up before God all the time. Whether you're doing well or whether you're not doing well, I'm the one that's standing in the gap and holding you before the Lord. And so God will hold me responsible if I fail to preach this word the way it is written in this book. Because I could use many other things and say it a whole lot differently, but it wouldn't be the truth. And God re requires that I speak the truth. Jude, as he writes this letter, he is writing because there is a lot of falling away that was taking place at that time. And so this is a timely book that we're looking at here today. As we watch the many churches that are emptying out, COVID, I call it, the, it was the door that swung wide, yeah. you know, for everybody to, to walk out, to not come, and the government helped it because it mandated that even churches, they couldn't open. While well, I praise God that he blessed us, we didn't close, we kept the church open during the COVID, and we had one, one Sunday that we didn't close the church because a, a bunch of us went to, to a meeting in Vegas uh, and came back with COVID. And so... We didn't want anybody else to catch the COVID until we had purged the church, cleansed it, the church. And so that one Sunday, we were closed because we didn't want anybody else to get infected. But the next Sunday, we were right back open. We've been open ever since. And I, I give do. God the praise for that. Yeah. Because there is no drop to stand in the open word of God that says he will watch over us 
He will protect us. He will keep us. And that we don't have to fear the things that the world is fearing. And there has been a lot of fear that has been taking place around COVID. And now there's a bunch of other things that are going on and they, the fear level is rising for those as well. And the COVID thing is doing a turnaround. It's coming back, so they say. But I tell you, when you put your trust in the Lord, you take care of what you need to take care of. Some people are still wearing their masks. I don't, you know, that's fine. If you want to wear your mask, fine. If you don't want to wear your mask, that's fine. But we trust the Lord. Mm -hmm. We don't trust what they say or what actually is. Because sometimes it's not just they saying. You can definitely see it taking place. But you don't, if you don't focus on those things. You focus on the things that the word of the Lord says. And the word of the Lord says that he is our shield. He is our protector. He is the one who causes us to, when we bow down, to lift us up. He's the one that we need to keep our eyes and our ears on. And so COVID opened the door for a lot of these things. And it's perpetuating. False teaching is helping to perpetuate of the falling away of many in this day. In Jude verse 3, he is exhorting and encouraging true believers to contend for the faith, which was once delivered. In other words, there's no new truth coming because the truth has been delivered, so he's not going to have another truth coming. And he tells us in verse 5 through 7, we have three instances. He gives us examples of what he's talking about so that we can relate. And he talks about, first of all, the people that came out of Egypt. God preserved them while they were in Egypt, brought them out of Egypt with the mighty hand. Moses was their leader, but then they got out there in the wilderness, and it's like they had forgotten about God, that he was the one that through miracles, signs, and wonders had delivered them. And none of them came out empty. They came out with a lot of stuff. And so they had forgotten about that, and they began to grumble, to murmur, and to complain. And those from a certain age, I believe it was 20 and upward, they died in the wilderness. Why? Because of their unbelief. You see, we have to contend for the faith church. We can't just expect, expect it to be set in stone, unmovable, because we once believed. You have to keep on believing. You have to keep on trusting. You can't stop along the way and say, well, you know, that's not working. That's what faith is for. Faith is the substance yeah. of things hoped for, not the things you already have. If you got them, you don't need any faith for that. It's the substance of things that you hope for, and it's the evidence of things that you have not yet seen. In other words, you're believing God to bring those things that he says he's going to bring because you trust him. And so we need to make sure our faith is anchored. After saving them from Egypt, many of them died in the wilderness. And then there are the angels that kept not their first estate. You see, when Lucifer was kicked out of heaven, he brought one third of the heavenly angels with him. And they are reserved in chains under darkness until the day of judgment. And then there's Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah where God rained down fire and brimstone upon them and uh, the cities that were around them because of their sexual sins. And so God gives us examples of what he will do if we fail to contend for the faith, if we fail to continue to keep ourselves in the love of God. Then Jude describes the, the teachers, the, the apostate teachers, the ones that are partially responsible for many people falling away. They contribute to the falling away of many. He called them filthy dreamers who defile the flesh, despise dominions or powers, and speak evil of dignities. In other words, they're drawing attention to themselves by speaking bad of everyone else. They speak bad of everyone else. But they call, they drawing you to me. Oh, look at me. Oh, you know, you ought to come over here. Oh, well, we don't do that. You know, we need we do this, so you need to come over here. And what they do is they divide the people. And they cause many people to fall away because once you get over there, you find out it's not the way they said it was. 
And so not only you work not over there, but you're not over here. So you just stay home. He's calling, they call many people to fall away. And so we need to pay attention to our spiritual walk so that we can maintain a healthy, fruitfulness of faith. We need to treasure all the ways that will help keep us close to the Lord. Meeting together like this is one of the ways that helps to keep us close to the Lord. The more you stay away from meetings like this, the more the easier it is for you to continue to stay away from meetings like this. And it's hard to get back. Once you've gotten comfortable where you are, it's hard to get back. So we want to maintain those things that keep us together. It tells us, tells us in his word, we are to treasure all of the ways that keeps us close. You see, as I mentioned before, it's easy to wander. It's kind, of, it's kind of like sheep with your head down. And we are the sheep of his pastor, right? You just got your head down. You're not looking where you're going. You don't know that you're leaving everything that you need, but you got your head down going someplace else. We don't want to wander, church. We want to stay anchored in the things of God. We want to make sure that what God says, we are hearing what he says, and then we are doing what God says, because it's not enough to hear. We need to obey. We, we need to not be so selfish that we let allow everything else that we want to come in and have our attention and have, you know, the way we walk and the way we do things and we neglect the things of God. Because it's difficult to stay true to what you've been taught and to live the life that God has called you to live because you cannot see what you're yet waiting for. All of us are waiting for glory. We're waiting for heaven. But we got to live in the here and now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we just can't allow ourselves to be, you know, swayed and sometimes tricked away from the things of God because we cannot yet see the things that God has promised to us. And it doesn't have to be in the great by and by. It could be some things that he promised us in the here and now. But we have not yet uh, they haven't manifested yet. We haven't seen them yet. And so now we get tired of waiting on them. And so we're going to go do something else. Well, I tried that. And so I guess I'm going to try this. No, you don't try God. It's kind of like you don't try to see if you like hell. You don't, because once you get there, you can't get out. And so we don't try God. No, we trust God. We have faith in what his word says. We have faith in the fact that Jesus had died on the cross for our sins. We have faith in the fact that he has promised he's coming back to receive us unto himself. That we, where he is, we shall be. We, have, we haven't seen those things, but we believe in our heart that these things are true. And these are the things that help to keep us anchored where, where God would have us to breathe. And so if you should check your life, if there's any place in your life where the lines have become blurred, where you're not quite sure, it's not as focused as it once was, then these are the times that we need to repent and check ourselves. We need to turn ourselves back to the things that we once knew were right and true and follow after those things. You see, one of our first duties, I told you there's sevenfold duties of the true believer. And the first one is, is to build yourself up on your most holy faith. You build yourself up on your most holy faith. The word build here means to create or produce gradually. When you're building something, you don't just go there and go boom, and the building is there. No, you have a brick by brick or board by board or whatever material you use. It's a gradual process before you get the building up. The same thing with you and I. We are building ourselves up on our most holy faith. In other words, we got to keep adding to our faith. We got to keep strengthening our faith so that it becomes stronger and stronger. So that when the winds of adversity come and they begin to blow, when troubles, you know, show up all over the place and you can't see your way out, you're still going to trust in the one who's able to keep you from falling. The one who's able to present you faultless before his presence. What joy it says. Yes. It, so this is the one we need to keep our faith and our trust, our hope in, because he doesn't change. Amen. Life changes. And so 
here in Acts 20 and 32, Paul says, and now brethren, he's talking to believers, I command you to commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified or set apart. He says, I commend you to the word of God. The word of God is able to build you up. And so this says, build yourself up on your most holy faith. So you take the word of God, you believe the word of God, and that helps to build up your faith. So you can't get any plainer than that. So as we take the word in, as we eat the word, Psalm says, as you meditate on the word, as you do what the word says do, you are building yourself up on your most holy faith. And then in two Corinthians two uh, in Colossians two six and seven it says as you have therefore received of Jesus Christ so walk in Him rooted built up in Him and established in the faith. You see, everywhere we look in God's Word, He's telling us how it is that we are to live, how it is that we are to build ourselves up in the faith, how we are to be rooted. That means, you know, it's not some surface thing that the wind or the water will wash away. No, it's deep. So we have to be rooted in the faith. And it says, after we have been established, then we are to abound therein with thanksgiving. And that's what we just talked about this morning. As Elder Payne opened up the service this morning, he was talking about thanksgiving because this Thursday is thanksgiving. And so we don't need a, a holiday to give us a reason to give thanks. If you woke up this morning, if you were clothed in your right mind, if you were able to put your foot out of the bed and stand up under your own power, if you had eyes to see, you had ears to hear, and I can go on and on and on with that, you have reason to give God thanks. And so we should always be giving God thanks, not just waiting for Thanksgiving, because God is good. And then verse 8 of that uh, Colossians 2, it says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. We have to beware. Be on the lookout. Be on guard. Don't just, you know, meander through the days as, as if nobody is trying to stop you from enjoying yourself. And so this is again why Jude is warning the believer to contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered to us. And so he tells us, the word I told you earlier, contend means to fight for, to strive for. So church, we must never forget that we have an enemy. Yes. I know we talk about the devil, but then when things start happening to us, we don't look to the devil as the one having control of trying to do things to us, we want to say God's not doing what he's supposed to do. Yeah. We don't look to the fact that we did something to bring it on. God is not doing what he said to do. But we have an enemy. And his job is to take us to, to rob, to steal, to kill and destroy. He wants to take your joy. He wants to take your peace. He wants to take your health. He wants to take your, your wealth, if you will. He wants to take everything that he can take from you to include your life and my life. You see, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not excluded from this. Just as he works against you, he works against me. And so that's why we have to make sure we're anchored in the faith. Make sure that we are continually striving for the faith. Even when it's hard to believe, if God's word says, that I can believe for this, that he will do this. I'm going to believe what God said, regardless to what every other report comes to me says, I'm going to trust what God says. And I got to stand there. Even when things are going bad, I have to stand there. It can be some physical stuff going on in my body, but I still have to stand on what the word says. Because God is not a man that he lies. He watches over his word to perform it. It's not going to return to him more. He didn't tell us how long we would have to stand on it. He didn't tell us that. He just said, stand and see the salvation of the Lord. And so our responsibility is to stand, is to continue to hold fast to what his word has said. And so 
Jude, as he continues to warn those to contend for the faith, we, we have to also contend for the faith that the enemy doesn't steal, kill, or destroy us. And so we can fight the good fight of faith. And so all through, although uh, Christians hear many voices, the voice of folly rings in our ears all the time. Foolishness rings in your ears all the time. But Jude warns the believer to beware of those voices and the dangers of folly that can cause us to drift off course. The second thing Jude tells us that we are to, our duty to do, we are to pray in the Holy Ghost. As uh, Colossians 1 Corinthians 14 and 4 says about this, he that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies, builds up himself. That's what that word edify means. It means to build up. You make yourself stronger in the faith. The Holy Ghost has been given to us for this very purpose. And even though prayer is one of the toughest things in the kingdom, God has called us to pray in the Holy Ghost. If you want to see the church really empty out, call a prayer meeting. <laughs> nobody will be there. When I say nobody will be there, the ones who call it, they'll be there. But it's hard to get people in for prayer. Yet we have to build ourselves up by prayer. And so no wonder so many people are weak. Because not that they don't come to our gatherings that we call for prayer, but how often are they praying where they are? Or are they praying those lay me down to sleep prayers? Lord, I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wait, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And in the word. <laughs> not in the word. But those are the kind of prayers we teach our kids, and they grow up when they get grown and they still pray. Lord, I lay me down to sleep and pray the Lord my soul to keep. In other words, you're not doing anything else to help your soul be killed, but you pray the Lord your soul to keep. So we don't want to pray those kind of prayers. As I said, Satan is, it uses all kinds of tools to hinder us and to stop effective praying. And I'm going to give you some examples of what I'm talking about. You're trying to pray and the telephone rings. You're trying to pray and somebody's at the door knocking. You're trying to pray and your mind begins to wander someplace else. You're trying to pray and you get sleepy. Or you're on your knees praying and it, sometimes if, if the family members and your door is closed, they don't knock, they just come on in. And you're down there trying to pray. You see, all of these things are things that the enemy will use to try to get you to stop praying. To get you off of what you need to do because prayer the prayers of the righteous, God says, avail it much. There's power in prayer. Mm -hmm. And so the enemy will try his best to keep you from praying. You may even have to go to the bathroom in the middle of your prayer. You, Excuse me, Lord. You know, I got to go. And so he uses all kinds of things is what I'm saying, church. And so we need to be careful that we don't allow the wicked one to hinder us. Because it's not an easy thing to just pray because you say, oh, I'm going to pray today. And you may have it this season, but if you're sincerely seeking after the Lord, the enemy is going to try all he can to keep you from praying. See, the only way we can be able to be great prayer warriors is to learn to depend on the Holy Spirit. He is the one who prays through us. He intercedes for us to God so that those things that we are praying will be acceptable to God. Intercession for the church is one of the Holy Spirit's main um, duties, if you will. He intercedes for the church. And so he must pray through us because he doesn't pray himself. He uses us to do the praying. And if we are failing to pray, then we are not allowing him to do what he has been given to us to do. And that is to pray to the Father in a way that is acceptable to the Father. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we can give some crazy prayers. Yeah. But God hears the That's Spirit. Right. The Spirit knows what the mind of God is and He takes our prayers and He gives them back to the Father. Sometimes in utterances and groanings, there are no words, you just groaning in the Spirit. 
for the spirit interprets that back to God because it knows us. And so the third duty is of the true believer is to keep yourselves in the love of God. Yes. You keep yourself in the love right. of God. Can't nobody else keep you in the love of God but you. I love it. You have to keep yourself in the love of God. You see, when you have important documents, you put them in a safe. Or you got something valuable, you try to put it in a safe place. So where can you, we keep ourselves safe? In the Lord's name. In the love of God. It's in the love of God that we keep ourselves safe. The word keep here means to uh, preserve. It means to protect from harm or from loss and destruction. And the way we do that is keep on loving God. Learn Amen. to love God more and more. And I tell you, the more you love him, the more you'll fall in love with him. That's right. Hallelujah. The more you, you learn his word, and the more you start walking in his word, and the more he'll open your eyes and he'll show you things that he's doing. He's been doing them all along, but yeah. you haven't seen them to now. And he'll show you how he's doing things, how he's working on things. Stuff can be falling apart all over the place, but he's still showing yeah, you that right. I'm working in your behalf. I'm doing things for you because I love you. Yeah. And so we need to keep ourselves in the love of God. Yeah. Jude 1 is written to all who are called, sanctified, and preserved in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul went on and wrote in 2 Timothy 4, 18, and he says, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. And then David, while he was living, he prayed, Preserve me, O God, for I put my trust in you. You see, when we put our trust in God, he will preserve us. Amen. That's Psalm 16 Amen. and 1. And it goes on and he says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. That's a command, church. Yes. And not, it's not a suggestion. Right. You all keep yourselves in the love of God now. And you just go on and he goes on. No. You keep yourself in the love of God. And it indicates that we must be doing something to keep ourselves in the love of God. Yes. We need to be praying. Yes. We need to be studying the word. We need to be coming together to meet with one another. We need to be serving, doing the things that God has given us to do. There's some things that we need to do to keep ourselves in the love of God. You see, nothing external can separate us from God's love. Amen. And Romans 8 and 38, I love this passage of scripture because it says, For I am persuaded, Paul is talking, but you can put your name there. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which right. is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So none of these things separate us from the love of God. What separates us from the love of God? We ourselves. We separate ourselves from the love of God. The fourth thing is looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I, I, I can't make it without his mercy. Mm -hmm. It is by his mercy and his grace that I was saved. Amen. It is by his mercy and his grace that I am kept. Right. So we can't make it without his mercy. Revelations 2 and 7 says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Because straight is the gate, Narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few there be that find it. In other words, you have to be looking for it. It's not going to walk up and slap you in the face and say, here I am. you got to be looking for the way that leads to eternal life. And then it goes on to say, uh, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that, are found, that find it. And so just because the crowd is all going this way don't mean they're going the right way. Yeah. you got to make sure that they're going the right way. And generally, if it's a crowd going that way, that's not the right way. You need to go the other way. Yeah. See, God makes it so simple for us. And we make it so complicated. We make it so hard. 
But it's not hard, church. He tells us we are to continue the straight path by building ourselves up, by praying and by anticipating what the word of the Lord says. And then number five, he says, on some have compassion, making a difference. On some have compassion, making a difference. What Jude is telling us here, he's telling us how to react to those who have been affected by false teaching. There are those who have been pulled aside because they were, they were ignorant. They didn't know any better. And so they have been pulled aside. It says, on them have compassion and make a difference between them who didn't willfully go and do something. They were led to do something because they didn't understand or know the truth. And for those, we are to make a difference and make sure that they hear the truth, that they can come back to the place that God would have them to be. So we are to show mercy. We are to show kindness to those that are wavering and disputing between God's teaching and that of the opponents of God. And 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26, it says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. See, there are some people that the things that they're doing is against their own, their own selves. But we're not to get the big chest, you know, and I know it all, and you need to be doing what I say. And we're not to be the one. It says in meekness, we are to instruct those that oppose themselves. In other words, the same hole that God took us from is still open. And you can fall back in that hole because God, he resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Yeah. And so we don't want to get puffed up, you know, they, because we know it all. And because you're such a wicked person, we're going to tell you what you need to do. No, in meekness, you instruct those who have opposed themselves. It may be that God will give them repentance when they acknowledge the truth and they can recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. See, he's the one behind all of these things. He's the one that's trying to take a hold of you and he holds tight. He doesn't want to let you go easily. So you're going to have to wrestle against that. Number six, it tells us, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Why does he use the word fear? Say with fear, pulling them out of the fire. These are those that are in danger of future judgment. You see, the faithful believers are to bring them back to the right relationship with God. Show mercy to them, but also to be extra careful that you don't begin to join in with them in the things that they're doing. That's why he uses the word fear. It don't mean shaking in your boots fear. But we are to acknowledge that God is the only way. That's right. That's right. And as we're seeking to help others, be thankful that God has called you and kept you and that God is keeping you because you can fall away. Doesn't mean that you're so good and you're so, you know, holy that you can't lose. You can. You see, you can remain in contact and accept the person without condoning and accepting their sin. You can show mercy to those in sin. And it's, it, even while you're showing mercy, if you're not careful, you can be drawn into their sin. There's some people that are so, they so much, I won't say in love with, but I don't think that's the phrase. They, they like their friends so much that they're willing to turn away from some of the things of God so that I can keep my friend. I don't want to lose my friend. So sometimes I go with my friend to do what they want to do, even though it's ungodly. And I know it's ungodly, but I want my friend. Well, Jesus is the one only friend that sticks close to his brother. He is the friend. He's the friend of us. And so we need to, he, Jude is advising us here to show mercy in fear like you're working on the edge of the flames because sin is deceitful and those that are, are trying to help others could sometimes themselves get trapped. And I'm going to use a person's 
name here to illustrate this. It's a true story. And so I'm not, you know, doing anything to bring them down. I don't know if any of you or many of you remember Carlton Pearson? Yes. Remember Carlton Pearson? Yes. He was a young, strong believer, filled with the Holy Spirit. Church was just growing, leaps and bounds. And he had an encounter with a Satanist. He went to the Satanist house by himself to minister to him. After he had that encounter with the Satanist, he came back and all of the things that he was preaching, he's preaching something different now. Mm. Most of the congregation left. And he's still doing that today, the last I heard. He's still holding fast to that. You see, I don't care how holy and how spiritual you think you are. You need to have the Holy Spirit not only with you, but you need to have someone else there who is praying with you and praying for you and standing against the powers of darkness because he went in there by himself. He didn't take anyone with him. And his church has been changed and his ministry has gone way down. He's still ministering, but his ministry is way down because once you know the truth of the word, I mean, when you know the truth of the word, you're not going to sit under those things that are not true. Amen. And so, I pray for him. You pray for him. That God will give him a repentance because he's one of those that has opposed himself. Then Jude 1, 23b says, and this is the seventh one, the last one. It says, um, hate the garments spotted by the flesh. He's not talking about having just a dislike, you know, oh, those clothes are dirty. I don't want to touch those clothes. It means to have a strong aversion to, a strong hate for. And it's not talking about just your outer garments. You see, because you can change your outer garments, you can freshen them up, you can put on something clean, and from everybody who's looking at you from the outside, you look all right. But if you haven't taken care of those undergarments, and that's what this word, take the garment, is talking about undergarments. That stuff which is hidden. And it's not necessarily talking about clothes. It's talking about our attitudes. It's talking about the things of our hearts. If you have, you can look good on the outside and come in and praise the Lord and hallelujah and to God be the glory. But if you're still walking around in sin when you walk out of the door and you're doing any and everything you want to do and can't nobody tell you nothing different, your undergarments are filthy. And it says that we are to hate the garments spotted by the flesh. You see, Jude is letting us know that we should have a strong aversion of hatred for sin. Not allow it, not tolerate it at all in our life, first of all. Mm -hmm. Because we're always looking at somebody else's sin and saying, you know, look at what they're doing and look at where they're going. But you know, those little hidden things, you know, we call them those little white lies. Well, there's no white lie, black lie, lies are lies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then those things that we do, you know, well, this is not as bad as what they did. At least I didn't go out and and sleep around all over the place and at least I didn't kill nobody. So we use the big things because you know that's what they do. But I don't do that. You know what I'm I'm I'm, I'm doing some things that I'm, I'm in my heart I'm not loving people. In my heart I am judging people. You know I'm doing we call those little sins. God doesn't call them little sins. Sin is sin is sin is sin. Is sin. I don't care what degree you put on it, all sin, all unrighteousness is sin. Yes. And so those are the little things that defile us. Those are the things that cause our garments to be spotted. And so we want to change that. We want to repent from those things. You see, we all walked according to the course of this world before we came to Christ. But now that we've come to Christ, we are to be laying aside every weight and every sin that is besetting us. In other words, we're supposed to be getting more and more like Jesus day by day. Yes. More and more like him day by day. The things that we used to like, the things that we used to enjoy, 
Those things should not have a draw on us like they once had. You see, if I used to party, I shouldn't like to party the same today as I did before I came to Christ. And there are some people that still like to party just as hard as they did before they said they accepted Christ. Well, we need to check ourselves and make sure we're in the faith. You see, God sees the heart. We're looking at the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing that counts. Right. And so, as I rush to a close here, um, sin is not just superficial outward stuff. If we allow wrong attitudes and behaviors to continue to live in us, this moral decay will eventually permeate deeper than the surface. It will penetrate deepest in the most hidden parts of our soul. If the, this filth is not dealt with, it can begin to work its way through every area of a person's life until that person becomes completely defiled. So it's imperative today, church, that we understand the consequences of sin and learn to hate even the smallest hint of his presence in our lives. We've hated in everybody else's life too, but make sure you include you first. And then if you want to study this out a little more, you can write down these three scriptures because I didn't write them out for you. Ephesians 5, 3 through 7, 1 Peter 2 and 11, and 1 Thessalonians 5 and 22. Ephesians 5, 3 through 7, 1 Peter 2, verse 11, and 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 22. So as believers, we have to constantly be on our guard, lest we be robbed of the essentials of the Christian faith by the craftiness of men, pretenses, you know, of those who are not godly. So we earnestly contend for the faith. We earnestly trust God, who is able to keep us from stumbling by walking according to what his word says and looking for the day when he shall come to present us faultless before his presence and glory. Jude closes in verses 24 and 25, and we sometimes use this doxology as we close the church here, and it says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. You can stop right there. <laughs> there's only one person that's able to keep you from falling. And it's to him that is able to keep us from falling. And then next, to present us faultless before his presence and glory. That's only one somebody can do that. That's Jesus Christ. That's right. He can present us faultless. You see, he died for our sins. And we have been washed. We have been cleansed. Thank you, Lord. Today we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And it's only because of the blood that was shed on Christ right. for our sins. You see, not only present us faultless before his presence, it said with exceeding joy. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's not just saying, well, I did my best, boy, here they are. <laughs> no, it's with exceeding joy that he will present us before his presence in glory. And so to him who is the only wise God, that none is wise as our God. He's the God of all knowledge. He knows all things. He's called omniscient. It means all-knowing. He is the one that is able to keep us. To the only wise God and our Savior, there was only one person that could save us. That was Jesus Christ because it took a spotless lamb. It took someone without sin to save us. And Jesus was the only one. Before his presence and glory with majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Yes. In other words, you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus today. Thank so he has presented us now. There will be a time when we will physically be there. But now we are there. Seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so Everything that I've talked to you about today is for your benefit, for my benefit. It's not something I'm telling you you need to do for somebody else. Mm. We need to do that for ourselves. Mm. This is what God has said. Do this for yourself. Keep yourself in the love of God. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. 
And it's our responsibility, not somebody else's. So don't take the duty lightly. Your life depends on it. Yes, it does. Your yes, life does. depends on it. What kind of life you have depends on it. One day we're going to see Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy one day we're going to be finished with all of this down here. We're going to stand before his presence in heaven. And there will be rewards given. Because the way we live our lives, there will be crowns that will be given oh, to us. Lord, you. you see, you can just barely do a little something for the kingdom and you may not get one or you may get one. It may have only one diamond in it or whatever they put in it. And then there are those that can live their life so full for God until the crown is just filled with jewels. You don't want to be one that only got one little jewel in it. You want a crown that is representative of who God is. And guess what you're going to do with the church and I'm finished? You're going to lay them at his feet. Oh yeah. Why are you going to take your crown and lay at his feet? Because without him we could do nothing. That's right. Everything that we have, everything that we are, or Thank hope to be, it all belongs to him. He alone is worthy of all of the reward and all of the That's glory right. that he receives. And so be presented, not grudgingly, because what are you going to do with it anyway? Yes. You're going to be with God and everything's going to be good. And you don't need to, you're not, you know, the pride of life has gone. So you're not going to walk around and look at my crown and looking better than your crown. You're not going to be walking around that way. <laughs> so you're going to lay him at his feet Amen. because he alone is worthy. That is so Father, we just thank you for your word today. We thank you, Father God, for your people today. We thank you that you continue to love us and to show us how we need thank to you, do better in our lives. And Lord, that's our desire. That's right. We desire to do all that you would have for us to do, to be all that you would have us to be. And so, Father, I ask that you would help us. Where we're weak, where we're missing the mark, Lord, help us. Touch us, Lord, that we might change, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for sealing this word, that the enemy would steal nothing. For it is in the mighty and precious name of your son, Jesus, we pray. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for this word.